So without further ado, as you're introducing yourselves, um, everyone, it's great to be here today. Um, I'm Maddie Martin, the Head of Growth and Education for Smith AI. We are a 24-7 virtual receptionist service for calls, chats, text, and Facebook messages. And we do a lot more than answer calls. We screen, schedule, complete intake for you, make outbound calls. We help with that top of the funnel so that when it comes to closing, you have great quality leads who are doing consultations and who are ready to be you know, closed in the first place. So I'm going to introduce and we'll actually let them introduce themselves, uh, which is always sort of the best approach. But Sonia Lacani, Carol Williams, and Justy Nickel here, all Smith AI clients, uh, actually longtime clients, and, and also firm owners uh, who have a lot of experience, not only in running a law firm and practicing law, but also running really the business side of the law firm and having to be in that hot seat where you're the closer. So I'm just going to go around in the order in which I see you, uh, but let's start with Sonia and then we'll go to Carol and Jesse. Guys, um, a lot of familiar faces, but for those of you who do not, don't, don't know me, I'm Sonia Lacani, also known as at Trademark Loyal Lady on Instagram, if you're a social media person. Uh, but that's what I do through and through. It's been a decade and counting of just filing trademarks for hundreds and thousands of businesses now at this point. Um, and I've written a book on it. I teach it to other attorneys. Um, I speak about it. I love everything trademarks, um, and I've, I've mastered it really, really well. Um, so I, I think I'm one of the few, if not only, um, solo slash small trademark firms in the U.S. that has surpassed $1 million in revenue, which was last year. So trying to keep that going. We're almost there for 2020. We'll keep it going. But uh, I, I definitely have mastered, I think, the marketing, the closing, the sales of, of trademarks. I mean, I, I can't talk to you about anything else. I'm a one-trick pony, but that's what I've got. <laughs> that's, so that's a great point, and we should touch on that later with respect to specializing and how that may help you be a better closer with greater familiarity in just one practice area. Absolutely. We'll talk absolutely about that. I've got tons to say. And, and Carol and Jesse too, right? I mean, Jesse has actually branched out a lot and bringing in other attorneys this year, but, you know, started with, you know, a couple practice areas that were really specialized and maybe even, you know, the animal law stuff, Jesse, that's something that we could particularly talk about um, and how that overlaps with your passion, which probably makes you a better closer, right? So yeah. uh, let's go to Carol and then we'll come back to you. Hey everyone, Carol Williams. I am in sunny South Florida. Um, so there's no snow in my world, which is fantastic. Um, <laughs> I own a boutique immigration law firm. I've been practicing for 22-ish years now. Um, had my own firm for a little over seven and uh, love talking law firm ownership and running the business, practicing law. All I do is immigration. This is the only practice area I have ever had um, that I ever want to have for the past 20 something years. Um, and I love talking sales. So I am super excited to be here. I am a Smith AI client as well, and they are part of my uh, sales process. So I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Thanks, Carol. All right, Justy, tell us about yourself. Hi, everybody. I'm Justy Nickel. Uh, I own and manage a partnership called Nickel Gersh Peterson in and around Denver, Colorado, but we operate virtually in about a third of the state and provide access to justice to our clients, even in rural areas, um, by oper operating paperless and using technology to our benefit. So I'm pretty passionate about the business side of things. I love building things. And as Maddie Martin said, I, um, I branched out recently. Uh, I've been a longtime Smith AI customer, even when I was solo. I have done every type of law, I swear, before I started my own thing uh, going on six years, six years ago now. And then I brought a partner on in June of 2019 and she was pregnant at the time. And I was like, all right, well, we got six months to figure this out because you're going on maternity leave for three months and there was no if, ands or buts about it. I was like, get out. Um, and so I ran her caseload and my caseload by really prioritizing intakes and everything. She came back from maternity leave right at COVID and then COVID hit and we thought we'd take a dip and all we've done is double our revenues over last year. Um, it's absolutely crazy because we're just, we're set up for it. 
some of it was we also added we added a, a family law partner in July of 2020 in the midst of COVID. So if things weren't hectic enough, let's just, you know, market a whole new branch of the firm. Um, but yeah, we've got seven people and a team of probably three or four additional contract attorneys that we're looking to expand on right now because we're so busy. Wow, that's fantastic. Well, I think, you know, something that we have heard touched on already, getting into closing, you can't talk about closing, uh, which, you know, if anyone doesn't know what we're talking about, when we talk about closing, it's actually getting that signed piece of paper, whether that's digital, your, your own thing, probably so. Um, are you getting that signature? It's one thing to have a really good conversation. It's one thing to have really good quality leads. Oh, the referrals are coming out of your ears. Fantastic. But if you don't close, really nothing else matters. And there's a lot of wasted money. I mean, everyone here knows how important it is to answer the phone, to be available for consultations, to um, communicate effectively. But the most important communication and the biggest area where there is sort of discomfort and the lack of business training and business acumen comes into play in an expensive way is with closing. So maybe we can get started with speaking, um, you know, and whoever wants to take this, where were you when you first sort of ventured out on your own? And what is the most dramatic difference to how you close now that you would like people to take away from this discussion? I will start. I, I will absolutely start. So I think this is, a, I'm just going to echo like kind of the theme of why we're here, like what's important about this, that I feel like as attorneys, as solo small firm, which I think majority of us are, it seems, um, I'm going to do my thing, put a one in the chat if you are a solo small firm, like owner, attorney, just so we have an idea of who's in the room and put a two with like, if not, and whatever it may be. Actually, the yeah, ones over 10, over 10 um, you know, uh, staff, uh, including attorneys. Yeah. Um, and the ones put your practice area because it's I like to know like who's around like that. This is my signature move. Like Maddie said, <laughs> this is my signature move. Like we want to know who's here. It's the best way we can like kind of make it as, you know, sort of like simulating real life. But I say this because like we work so hard as solo smalls to write those blog posts and get those videos out and you're paying for leads, you're doing all this, you're working so hard. And then if, you know, for, you know, I mean, shameless plug for Smith, but if someone's not answering your phone after all that, because you're in a meeting, right? And that now, now that person's calling someone else or they're like, oh, they're not there or they move on to the next attorney, right? Or if you do get on the phone and then the conversation doesn't go the right way, like for whatever it is, like it's, it's a waste and it's a shame because we, it's hard to get, you know, people to call you in certain areas sometimes. And we just work really hard for it. And the beauty of closing and knowing how to do this is that that's actually less people that need to call because if you're just closing all of them, then it could just be 10. It could just be 10 for the week. It could be five if you're closing four out of five, right? So for me personally, where I feel like the shift came when I first resigned um, as an associate, uh, from my last law firm position, as opposed to now five of the 10 years, um, I've been running my own practice. So the first five was elsewhere. So I feel like the biggest shift came was like, uh, someone schedules a consultation or wants to chat with you. And you're like, sure. What questions can I answer? And it's like, pew. And you're letting them be like, well, how much does this cost? And I'm like, oh, no, 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 we're not leading with that. That is not what we're going to do. <laughs> that's the person we're that not lead, What we're not doing today is letting right. you lead the conversation. But that's where, that is where clients will go first. Because all they're thinking is, oh, man, this is going to cost me a lot of money. Do I even need to do this? Like, as a trademark lawyer, right, we're like your preventative. We're the vitamin. We're not your aspirin, right? Like, we're Are you turning it into an interrogation also? You know, you might be setting yourself up for a dead silent conversation there, or you could be setting yourself up for, like, you know, some cross-examining, like, really unpleasant conversation where you're yeah. the enemy until you win their heart. Yeah. Or like throwing stupid questions at you. Like, so I was just curious, like, do I even need a trademark? Why are we on the phone? If you're questioning the what? <laughs> like, this is not my job. To, or so what do you think about legal zoom? I'm like, did I really make time out of my day to, and that's the thing, right? If you're gonna get you, you work that hard, you get it. You're finally on the phone and you've dropped this. There's an opportunity cost. We think you're just sitting around. You're like, all right, I'll take a call. There's an opportunity cost for every minute you're on the phone doing this. You're not doing or able to do something else. Totally. And so the shift came from me trying to like 
just being there as a resource to I'm in the driver's seat. I have a script. I have a framework for how this conversation is going to go. And in, I know it doesn't sound like a long time, but I'm hitting six years in January in that time frame. And once I figured it out, like the first couple months, I don't deviate for any reason. We follow the framework exactly. And it's process, uh, process, time frame, and cost in that order. And we start with, Hey, so um, great. How's your day going? Good. You have some nicety. Some I'll find something about the weather, college, wherever you are, whatever. I've been making a lot of jokes about like being trapped inside. Like my my signature opener right now. Seriously, I'll just give it all away. I don't care. I'm like, I'll open a conversation. I'm like, hey, how's your day going? They're like, well, you know, good. I'm like, how's your day? Two thousand and what nine hundred and forty two of this shit. And they're like, you know, <laughs> honestly, it hasn't been so great. Like it 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 breaks the ice a little bit, right? And. Obviously, you know, um, choosing an attorney is a personality choice. At the end of the day, a lot of questions I get about marketing and about all this is like, well, how do I differentiate your personality? You can open with that and just be like, yeah, I'm, I'm not a regular attorney. I'm a cool attorney, right? Like we can chip, we can, we can chit chat, we can have a conversation. Um, but yeah, after that, I'm like, so tell me a little bit about your business. Like, what are you up to these days? How's your branding going? And I'll see how I can help. There's a 30 to 45 second introduction from them. Well, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, uh-huh. Okay. And I cut, I loop it off. I'm like, oh, okay. We're not going on and on about right. I, I need assess where you are. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, great. Let me tell you a little bit about the trademark process. I explain the three, st the three stages. And then I'm like, this is how long it's going to take. And then the variables, whatever. And I'm like, after all this, I want to pause for any questions you may have. Mm -hmm. Maybe answer whatever. I'm like, okay, great. Why don't I go ahead and get into our, our uh, billing process now? explain how we're flat fee and not hourly. And so, you know, we'll get into the details, but that is my framework process, time frame, cost in that order. And I'm telling you everything. And it's like the scripting is based off of commonly asked questions, misconceptions. It's all embedded in there. Anticipating the questions. So it's already looped up in there. So by the time I finish questions. my like two to three minutes, they're like, wow, that was really thorough. And no, I don't have any questions. And like, yeah, I'm ready to move forward. Like 90, imagine your conversations, like 98% of them going, great. Yeah, like I'm ready when you are. And I'm like, great. I, I ping my assistant. I'm like, send the follow-up right now. And we just get, like, I'm not even moved to my next consultation before the retainers start coming in. That is how quickly and pinned down this process is. So I still do majority of them because I feel like that's something I don't want to delegate. You, you know, we all kind of choose our stuff, but yeah, I mean, for me, that was a big shift that I really think is transferable from any practice area. You're yeah. in the driver's seat and you're not here to just answer questions and be a resource. Drive the conversation, know what you need to tell them, what's gonna inform their decision, whatever it is your practice area or whatever their issues are, right? Their anticipations and then, you know. So that's right. my there's take a, There's a different set of questions that you're going to ask based on your practice area. You know, I know that Justy asked certain questions like, do you have a court date schedule that Sonia, you're probably not asking, right? Sure, so, sure. Yeah. so there are things that help inform her around, you know, whether or not she's going to be willing to even have that conversation. And that's sort of a screening question. And then when you're prepared, you know, all right, let's talk about the situation. Now, Carol, you know, before even we started recording, you were talking about process. And I know that's something that you're extremely focused on. Um, how did you come to appreciate why process is so important? So, yeah, we were talking about this before. So, the reason I've come to appreciate a process, despite the fact that I'm totally type A and I like things to go the way I like them to go, <laughs> is because I found myself when I first started my firm not knowing how to run a business. And so that included not having any idea about sales, not even knowing that there was sort of a difference between sales and marketing and that they had two very different functions. And so I found myself giving away all of this free, very valuable information when I first started because I thought, oh, it's all about building rapport. It's all about having this conversation so that at the end of the conversation, they felt comfortable and then they would sign on the dotted line. But what was happening was they felt amazing because they were getting all this free information. I mean, I was literally getting off of the phone, doing research, calling them back, and giving them more free information. Who wouldn't feel great, right? <laughs> like, I, I My mean- My blood pressure is rising as I hear <laughs> It's really rising. You know what I mean? 
<laughs> like literally like who wouldn't feel great about that? And so then I realized they weren't closing, like they weren't hiring me. And I, it took me a while to figure out because I was giving away everything. Like I was giving away all of this free information to them. And so when I started to dial that back and I started to really read about sales and read about marketing and figured out the difference between the two of them and realized that I needed a process and I needed to be in control of that process, um, it just started to be so much easier. And so Lake Sonia, I have, I have it scripted. Um, you know, there are certainly different qualifying questions that I have to ask. I work with two very different populations for my client base, but I've streamlined my initial conversation with someone down to just about seven minutes, quite honestly. In seven minutes, I can pretty much determine whether or not I can help you. It doesn't mean I have figured out all the red flags, everything that could go wrong, because as lawyers, we're hardwired to figure out everything that can go wrong, and our instinct is to want to talk about that. I, I don't talk about what could go wrong, right? I talk about, can I help you? Because at the end of the day, if something goes wrong, I'm there to help you with that. And so I think always being doom and gloom, I have found, because I used to do this, I'm like, well, I mean, but if this happened, then this, and then if that happened, oh my God, and they, I'd freak them out. I would freak <laughs> them out and then I'd give them all sorts of free information. And I'm like, real, like, no, that's just, it's not a good look. So now I've really gotten it, you know, basically almost down to seven minutes and then they will schedule a consultation. They feel comfortable. And when I get them in that consultation call, it's, and I tell them, I set an agenda at the beginning of every single call. That's how I let them know that there is a process. That's how I let them know that I'm in control of this conversation and it's going to go in a very certain way. So I tell them, it's my job during this time with you to figure out if I can help you and if we're a good fit to work together. And it's your job to figure out if you think I'm a good fit to work with you. And if at the end of the day, one, I can't help you, or two, we don't think we're a good fit, that's okay. You still walk away with good information. I also tell them, I'm going to interrupt you because I need to get information so that I know whether or not I can even help you. Immigration is a huge, huge, huge topic. You know, you may say something, I'm like, er, that's not, that's not the piece of immigration that I handle. So I don't want to waste your time, but I'm going to refer you to this person who I know can handle you, who I know is amazing, who I know is great. Um, you know, and if, you know, if we go kind of down my process, I'll know by the end of the call, one, if I want to work with you, if I think we're going to be a good fit, because there are some practice areas where you may work with someone for like six months and then, you know, and then your case is over. I work with people for several years on average. So I really want us to have a good relationship and that we're partners. And so I tell them that during the consultation and I'm, you know, and I tell them, it's okay if you feel like I'm not the right person for you. If you feel comfortable, tell me why. And I'm happy to send you to someone who I think is, but mm -hmm. if you think I'm the right person and I think you're the right person for us to work together for years, let's make this happen. Like, I want to see you get to your goal just as much as you want to get there. Like I enjoy seeing my clients succeed. And so when they hear that, and I think, and I'm, I'm genuine, I really do want to see my clients succeed. That's something I think that they really appreciate, you know, and then at the end, we talk hard numbers. We talk numbers. We talk about when, when you are going to pay, what happens if you don't pay. Um, I was so, so afraid of that piece of the conversation when I first opened my doors. And now I have no problems with that piece of the conversation <laughs> because it's a vital piece to the conversation. It's a part of working with a business. And they, and they expect you to talk about that. Because a lot of times, like Sonia said, they'll come in and say, okay, well, how much is this gonna cost? I'm like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm gonna talk about what you're going to get, what I'm going to give to you. And I wanna know what you expect from me. And then we'll get to the payment piece of it. But it's a process. And once I had a process in place, and I've certainly tweaked it over time, and I'm always looking at ways to tweak it and make it better. 
Um, but once I have a process in place, it just feels so good and so natural. Yeah. But I think the cost being at the end is like very carefully placed because you need a context around it. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't like the word justify, but like internally for us, we can say that, like, I don't like to say that client facing, but it's true. I mean, let's call it what it is. Like they, they need some sort of justification. So if you're not the cheapest around as an attorney, which I don't recommend that you do, cause you don't, you know, really ever make good money that when, why not charge, charge your worth? Like I'm definitely more expensive, I think than the average trademark attorney, but I also like have made a habit of like encouraging people to raise their prices, but they need some context around that. Mm -hmm. So now that they've heard your process and the questions you've asked and the silent thing, there is the authority, right? You're leading and there is the expertise. So that it, it's all the silent stuff that goes into, Oh, okay. Like I'm willing to pay that. That makes sense to me. But if you just throw it out there, like if you didn't know Louis Vuitton from Walmart, you'd be like, well, handbag is a handbag, isn't it? A lawyer is a lawyer. Right, you that's can do an immigration and so can she. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it matters. Context matters. It does matter. And the other thing here is that if you set clear boundaries up front, if you introduce price in the first discussion, then you're not scared of it for the rest of the relationship because you already broke that ice ripped off that band-aid if you're not comfortable with it. And once it's out there, it's out there, right? So you don't have to go back to them later on and say, you know, oh, I forgot to tell you this one thing, you know, that makes you look disorganized, unprofessional, et cetera. If you come right out with it, then you set a standard, a foundation for control. And you also, in having this process where you are setting the next question out there and the next steps, you know, for me, at least someone who has worked with attorneys in the past, I've been divorced, et cetera. And I know like, well, this gives me confidence as a customer, as a client, that they're going to be as prepared with every future thing that we do together. So if you look prepared in that first meeting, you set a standard for that sort of professionalism and preparedness in every future piece of work together. I was just going to jump in and say, I think that's the one thing that we all do is we start with a script and then we end with the price quote. And then a little bit of follow-up questions about that, but my intakes are similar, right? Like I, I'm a big fan of Billy Taras Tarascio. Uh, I never yes. even actually, yeah. Um, Billy's modern family practice is amazing and she's got scripts on there for free for what she does. And I've kind of morphed over time too, like Carol. Um, the biggest thing that I think new people who are not used to this kind of hard push, hard ask, is you get this feeling like, I went to law school, so I wasn't a used car salesman. What the hell am I doing, right? Like, how, when you're your own firm, like, you there is, school. right? it's, right, and I mean, my undergrad is in business, so, like, I did this stuff. Well, right? you're and a property manager. You actually have a very unique and competitive different. advantage in, in knowing yeah. how to run businesses. Yeah. But at the same time, I never learned how to sell and I never did cold calling and people who did telemarketing and, you know, like telemarketing, not the skiing, but the telemarketing, I telemarked too. So oh, <laughs> annual fund while I was a student. That's You're amazing at sales, right? Like mm -hmm. it just, it teaches you this. So what I did early on was I found a small business development center um, class for sales forecasting and what I needed to do to get my head around, okay, this is how many people, for me, it was data. Like this is how many people I need to make a new connection with each week when I'm starting out. Like I had a goal. I wanted to send out 10 new business cards and you know, shake hands with 10 new people I'd never met with before. So in order and, to hit your goal, knowing sort of what your target conversion rate is, you looked at the top of the funnel and you said, yep. I need to pour this much water in the pot to reduce it down to this much chicken stock. Yep. Yep, exactly. And it was early on, that's, that was the best thing that I did was forecast what sales needed to look like so I can make the money that I needed to do to make my you know, firm float, because it was basically just me. And then I followed the script on intakes, for sure. Um, and I've gotten it simplified. So my clients are not business people. You know, they are straight up 
seventh grade reading level, if I'm lucky, mostly have mental health issues. I do criminal defense for God's sake, right? Like <laughs> half of my clients come court appointed. So um, we have a really, really simplified signing process. It's all digital. And I start my my calls with the same way, like, hey, these are the screening questions that I have ran through Smith AI, that I have ran through my type form. This is what you told us. I'm going to pair it back to you what we told, what you told us. And then I'm going to ask pointed questions about what you told us. Because we are asking so much detail up front that we're not getting crap leads anymore. Like we're getting qualified leads. And some of it is we ask on the type form, what, how do you plan to pay? Because we're not accepting pro bono. So we flat out Like we offer a ton of different financing, three month internal financing interest free, six month internal financing interest free on felony cases. We have an external payment processor that we can get a lender to finance your entire case for you. So we ask on there right up front, are you having family and friends help pay for your stuff? You know, because then I think about like, okay, at the end of this call, I have to also turn in the third party guarantee form. Right. So we have an extra signature that clarifies, even though they pay, they don't get to direct the legal and they don't have confidentiality. So dad or mom, that's true. Right. Right. Yeah. So there's an extra form. And I'm thinking already from this initial intake, these 10 questions, what I need to do during this. We always ask, do you have a former lawyer? You know, like, are you looking to make a change? If you're looking to make a change from the public defender's office, like we get that. But if we're your third private attorney, there's a problem. Big red flag. Family law, you'll probably see more of that. Big red flag. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, As red as this cup. Yes. Happy holidays. So (laughs) at the end of the call, though, we do eh, 10 minutes of so, like getting to know each other, breaking the ice, doing like year, decade, the decade of 2020 jokes really do work right now. Um. (laughs) And then like 10 minutes getting to know each other, getting to understand the legal problem, maybe a little bit of question and answer more for like the la- the next five minutes. So like the first 15 minutes of our 30 minute consult is just conversation. And then the last 15 minutes, okay, I'm like, all right, this is what I think we can help you with. This is what I don't think we can help you with. And a lot of times I'm one of those attorneys that is not going to sell somebody based on fear. You hire me or you go to jail. That doesn't fly here. Right. Like, Sounds you're like you're in a really bad situation. Exactly. Yeah. I'm like, I'm not going to use fear tactics to get you into the door. I'm going to tell you, I don't think you need an attorney mm-hmm. if you don't need one. And I'll trade that for a good Google review and I'll get off the phone in 15 minutes. If I think you need an attorney, then I'll be like, okay, here's why I think you need an attorney. You know, this isn't just a first time DUI. This is a third and you're one step away from a felony. We're talking about possible jail time. We're talking about jail during COVID, right? Like kind of just talk to them and be like, all right, I can help you on the legal side. Or it sounds like you may have a legal issue, but I need you to do some mitigation too. We don't just do this as a, we're going to handle everything for you. You're part of the team. Mm -hmm. And so then I lay out, this is how teamwork works for us. We give you access to your evidence with a Dropbox link as soon as you download it. And I don't think that's recommended in every state, but in Colorado, it is. Um, We give you access to your pleadings from the beginning. We don't hide the ball at all. You can see what we're doing. You can see what we're drafting. We schedule a discovery review for you. Here's what the first two weeks after retaining us looks like. And this is the realistic expectation on time frame. And people are just like, wow, that's that's what I needed to know because criminal it's out of your control. You show up when they tell you to show up. And when you get an attorney, that kind of changes a little bit. You have a little bit more control. So I, I found getting really comfortable with sales, having those red flags up front, ending with this is how much it's going to cost you. And this is why we're different. And now we've taken it to the next level and we actually put in um, our acuity our follow-up emails, once you book an appointment with us, before you've talked to anybody in our office, besides maybe Smith, um, you get an infographic about what to expect for your in- initial consultation. 10 minutes to talk about the case, five minutes to talk about, you know, question and answer, 10 minutes to really close it down and talk about what the fee looks like and next steps. And it's broke down right in there. These are our attorneys, you know, and they get it in their email. And I've had people reply to that because we also ask if you want us to review any paperwork, send it through this. And I get more information before I even sit down um, to do the thing. And then when I'm in that middle section, right, like that's the gray area where you get people who are like, 
oh, I don't know, it's so expensive, or do I really need a lawyer? And I'm like thinking they really need a lawyer. This is a felony. You're freaking crazy, right? Like um, what I have done is worked very closely on the nine most common objections that we get with, within our team. And we've scripted those answers, right? So a big one for us is you, I have another attorney down the road that'll do this for this a third DUI. He's going to do it for three grand. You're telling me it's five. And I'm like, you're welcome to talk to other attorneys. You'll be back. Ask them about their process. <laughs> it is what it is. What they and then what we do is after the call is over, I put them in the email drip campaign where I send them the PDF on what to ask the other attorneys. Oh, I love that. And I give that. them questions. Oh, I love that. Nice. Really brilliant. Another that's, thing. That I, that's so good. Is, yeah. Um, doing a video actually that's unlisted on YouTube. Maybe it's on a page on your website, but sort of the thanks for signing, here's what's next, or thanks for signing, you made the right choice, and sort of like building up a little momentum for that that kickoff of the engagement. Yeah, and we, wanna... we like infographics a lot for that sort of stuff. So we have like three or four we send out, like meet our team, here's why we're different, here's what to ask another attorney, here's some helpful information just about where the hell to go. <laughs> And that's going to depend on your practice area too, right? Like, you know, Sonia working with someone, Carol working with another, you working with another, you may, and you probably do for everyone who's here, you know where your clients are. Like, where are you meeting them? Are you meeting them at the seventh grade reading level? Or are you reading them at a master's degree, right? So if you're working with people who are, you know, white collar professionals or in blue collar roles or whatever the case may be, you are best served by addressing them in the, you know, ways and where their habits already exist. You know, if you expect that they're a seventh grade reading level, maybe a short infographic is better than a sort of long drawn out video that might appeal to more of a, a business law client. Right. Yeah. I wanted to add a couple of things. Um, so first of all, I feel like a lot of, um, attorneys or a lot of our participants may feel like, well, like, I don't know, right? I don't know the commonly question, like commonly asked questions. I don't know what stuff to incorporate, you know, and unless like this is month one of your practice, you do know, but you got to give yourself more credit. You, It's up here. And so if you need to flesh that out, like one thing that I would recommend, I mean, I teach a lot of attorneys some of this stuff and I feel like one, I didn't do this because I didn't need to, because I was just thinking about it and paying attention. But I feel like one really great exercise is have a, get a spiral notebook from Target and do a diary of every single consultation call. Dear diary, today I talked to so-and-so and this these are the questions they asked me. These are the objections they had. This is the issue. This was their answer when I said this, whatever. Like recap it like you're a doctor, like for a patient file, like what happened, what they said, whatever. Absolutely. And then like, so that way you have some data, really. Like, data is not numbers. Data is also facts. Data is also questions. It's all the pieces, right? So that's one way to kind of see trends. But I wanted to say what I love about Justy that um, she didn't actually come out and say, but you touched on a cardinal rule of mine. And I feel like I need to like establish this for everybody. Like I have a few cardinal rules of how I operate in life. One of them for the law practice is make it easy for people to pay you. What, know yep. what she said. I circled that to come back to. <laughs> I yeah, need notes like, like, I'm making notes. letter of engagement. <laughs> Online payment links. Oh, yes. well, but you know, signing software is this much a month. I don't care. It's worth one new client. Law yeah. pay takes too many fees. Are you serious? Like, what are you operating? A, like a... <gasps> Attorneys a lemonade stand, I'll, like, drop, get real. I'll drop this 39% faster from the Clio report, which you guys always, gals, always hear me citing. 39% um, faster when you take electronic payments. And, and the vast majority of clients expect you to take online payments. In this day and age, if, in this day and age, if you are asking me to print and sign the contract, I have news for you. I mean, and this, I have behaved this way as like a hire for services. I'll pick someone else. I'm like, I don't have time for this. I have a printer. It's in that cabinet, like tucked away. Cause that's how much I don't want to look at it. And the it's only thing new. I, use I my got it because painting. of the pandemic. <laughs> I didn't want it before, but sometimes life has driven me. To that. But it's like, I don't use it. I don't want it. Like I am not, I'm going to pick somebody else because you need to make the hurdle between Oh, I'm really interested in this amazing consult you gave me, and you need to just close that gap as soon as. I mean, that is part of sales, um, which brings me yeah. to the other point that I wanted to touch on. That kind of 
it's like a cloud over this whole thing that we don't talk about enough, which is something called imposter syndrome. So if you're not familiar with it, I really encourage you to Google it. There's an assessment that I circulate. It's not mine. I just found it. But it's a really interesting quiz to kind of see like, wow, I actually do have a lot of issues around psychology and money. And I know it kind of sounds like woo woo Fifi, but it's, it's stay with me for, for like 30 seconds. It's your money story and how you grew up around money and like things that date way back actually influence your ability to charge what you feel like you're worth. You're like, well, I don't know. And I don't, I want to just blah, blah, blah. And I don't want to follow up. And like, it's all up here. Right. So that's another thing. I mean, I cannot tell you the breakthroughs I've seen my attorneys that I teach when we talk about this piece of it, because that piece of it gives you the balls really identifying to, it to throw the rate it. out there and be like, you know what? It's 3,500 for that. Seriously. Yes. yes. That's how much it is. Well, but okay. Like Justy said, right? Like, and it's, it is what gives you that confidence. I will say this, that I've played around with this a lot, like where the confidence comes from and it flows from, you know, the top. It's the confidence that allows you to put post on a video. You're like, yeah, I'm worthy of this. I can put this out there. Like people won't laugh at it. It's not stupid all the way through. Yes. I want to have this consult. I can drive it. I can do this and I can charge my worth and I can, you know, do all these things. But there was one time once where I was like, let me just see like how this conversation, it, I charged $7,000 for a trademark process and they paid it in five minutes after the consult. And I was like, oh, holy shit. But like that is, I mean, I don't do that. That's to me asinine. Like, but like it tells you what not only closing skills, but what confidence can do for you. I mean, you gotta, like, you gotta kind of think about that. So I just wanted to share those two pieces is cardinal rule, make it easy for people to pay you, put yourself in the shoes and say, if I called, is the number getting answered every time? Cough, Smith, cough. Okay, <laughs> after that, is there electronic letter of engagement? Is it on like, like bam, 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 bam? I don't want any back and forth. Don't it's make it hard for me. On to that and then number two, look into your imposter syndrome issues because I swear to you, we all have them. I, I do too. Seriously, we all do. But like, no, it's do. really important to look at this. And I want to give Carol a chance, a chance to- <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, one of, the, one of the things that I say often, because I deal with individuals who- in their culture, bargaining is just a part of doing business. Mm -hmm. They full on expect me to bargain because that's what they're used to doing back at home. They bargain for everything. Mm -hmm. So I have honest to goodness. Know where your I've, clients are coming from. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's, that's, that's exactly it is know who your client base is. So part of my client base lives their life bargaining for everything. So it's not something that I take personally, mm -hmm. but I have, I have literally my, I had a consult earlier this week who I closed, but who three times said, well, is, is there a discount? And I, and I have said, I don't discount my work ever. So when they asked me the second time, I was like, no, there's no discount. I don't discount my work ever. I love that. And so at the very end, again, she was like, but are you sure there's not a discount? And I'm like, oh, I'm sure. I don't discount my work ever because you know what? Sally May doesn't appreciate when I take a discount. <laughs> <laughs> my cable yeah. doesn't appreciate when I take a discount. And frankly, I like nice things. So <laughs> I'm not going to discount my work because at the end of the day, you, you don't want less work done right? So, Absolutely. Do you and, want me to do discounted work right. for you? And, and you don't want less value, but, at, but at the same time, well, you don't take offense at it, right? Because and I was going to say at the same time, process, I don't take offense to it because for, for many of my clients, it's cultural. So when I know what it, so I, so when I know where the origin of it comes from, it's not personal, but also for my clients where it's not cultural, we have to remember as lawyers, we've gone to law school. We now have tons of friends. They're all lawyers. So we know what it's like to be around and work with other lawyers. A lot of our clients don't. Sometimes we're the first lawyer that they ever come in contact with. Or the first great lawyer they've ever come in contact with. Fair. <laughs> but, that's, <laughs> but that's why I think that the, that first call, our sales call is so important because it's, it is an opportunity for us as lawyers to explain to them 
what they can expect from us and how we work. And you know what? I'm not going to work the same as the person that has the ad on the billboard and the park bench. No, no offense to them. I think that's, it's great marketing if it works for you. Right. But that's not how I work. I'm not a contingency law firm. So if you've spent all of your time at home during COVID watching television and hearing, you know, you don't pay me unless I get you money. That's fantastic. I'm not a contingency practice, but clients, potential clients don't understand that. They may not understand that they even have to pay for a consultation. Yes. So I, so I, I used to. The majority of marketing is coming through contingency practices. Yeah, also. I admit I used to take it absolutely a hundred percent personal. And I, and one day I was like, you know what? They just don't know. And it's not their fault. It's you my job. That to tone to the conversation. It. Exactly. You don't, you don't take the conversation off in that sort of combative way, but it can go if you let it. So right. there's a couple questions that are coming through here in the chat and it's already been 45 minutes somehow. So um, <laughs> I'm going to just really quickly tackle because I know Jesse's going to get to one, but there was a question, you know, reasonably so um, that was back and forth a little bit around, well, do you, if you see the answers come through that intake form, that screening form initially, not indicating that this person is a good potential fit. Do you still take the consultation? Do you still go through this process? Well, what do you think the answer is? The answer is no. You know, if you can spare your time and it's very clearly not a fit, then you basically have, you know, a couple options. One, you can take the call if you know you want to ask a couple more questions to make an even better referral, or you can cancel the call and make a referral. But the conclusion is the same. You're going to try and make a referral unless you think that that would be damaging to your referral partners, right? If there's a really big red flag. Otherwise, your goal is to help that person and quickly, but your goal changes from trying to capture that business to trying to refer someone who can capture that business. Yeah, and that was gonna be where I, I put the answer in the chat to where I was going. Um, I, with the other question here, which was about unbundling, um, we actually do discount. So we offer a student rate and a veteran rate because it's not always like if you're in the criminal justice system, you're not there by choice, right? So it's also hard. And then we, we market to kind of that group as well. Um, so what ends up happening is we get people in the pipeline and then they, they want free legal advice or they can't actually afford to pay. Even with asking that question, they actually can't. Um, or the issue is one that is so simple that I'm like, eh, I don't want to really jump in here, right? Like, it's not a good use of my time. I'm going to charge so little and make no difference, right? Um, animal law, I know, Maddie, and um, you brought this up earlier. I actually am one of the few attorneys in Colorado where I am actually an expert in animal law. Like, I teach this at university level um, about prosecuting animal cruelty. You know what that does not translate to? Criminal defense work, <laughs> But if you Google me, like you only get animal law, like from that context. So people are calling like my girlfriend stole my dog and I want it back. We actually changed that and put in, cause I know, I know enough about all this stuff. I've written the animal dog bite statute. I've done replevant, you know, there it's just, it's not a moneymaker for our firm. Instead of giving it away during the consult, what we did was we built DIY packages where you pay me a thousand bucks and I talk you through how to do it. I can like review pleadings that you write. I will not ghostwrite for you, but we, we moved it into a money-making revenue stream instead. And we cut the free time down to 10 minutes. And then I built a template using Canva and I just pl plug and play. And I crank that work out and I make a thousand dollars an hour doing that sort of stuff instead of giving away 30, 30 minutes of free information. So there's some things that are more easy to piece out. And there are even some things that, you know, maybe you don't piece it out, but there are flat fee packages that you put together. Um, you know, in a state, some other family law, some practices, you can put together a package that's predictable if you want to go that route. Um, and, you know, that's very transparent, maybe even with prices on your website and you have less of that conversation. There is a question in the chat around, um, you know, <laughs> I, we know that some of you have these conversations. They seem great. There's no objections. The conversation goes as well as it could possibly go. They say, send me, I'm going to sign right now. And then they don't sign. And you're wondering like, 
Am I, you know, in bizarro world? Like what just happened? I feel like I have a pretty good read on things. What is your suspicion, uh, you know, in that scenario? What most commonly happens for, for any of you? Do you want to speak to this? I think you've got to have a follow-up process. I think if they're not calling you back, you, they either one were never serious, which is which is you know sometimes happens. Two, right. two, they were only shopping for for free information. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think sometimes they haven't decided a hundred percent that they really need a lawyer. And they're afraid. Again, a lot of time, especially for, because I think you said this was for the criminal practice, they're mm-hmm. afraid. Like they don't know what they don't know. Also makes it real to engage yeah. the attorney. You can't be in think, denial anymore. I think the way that you potentially get around people ghosting you in the beginning is to have a really buttoned up follow up system. You know, every three days, touch them, and, you know, and you decide how far out past the initial conversation you want to follow up but at some point you just got to let them go and so as a way to protect yourself have a clause in your contract that says this is void after x number of days Mm, so that they can't come back you know six months later when things are really heating up and really hot or they've tried to diy and now and now they really need help be, but they're also looking at a completely different issue than what you initially talked to them about but i think if you set a follow-up schedule you will find that they weren't really ghosting you they just didn't know that next step. They were terrified of that next step, but the, the, the law firm and the person that sort of gently nudges them along, you will actually close that. Cause I've had several of those folks, you know, I think immigration and criminal practices are, they're sometimes very much intertwined, <laughs> but you can have a population of people that are just terrified to ha- even have a conversation So just, you know, so just gentle prodding along the way will get them to trust you, know you, like you, sign on the dotted line, and then they will become your best referral source later. We automate, yeah. And we automate about three of the six follow-up steps that we do too. Yeah. Some of it's personal stuff, but I delegate that all to staff. Mm -hmm. Um, or Smith AI, who will make outbound calls for you. Um, I'll often send Smith a script and just be like, hey, these are the leads that didn't call this week or didn't touch in this week. Can you just call them and make sure that they don't have any additional questions? If they do, here's the calendaring link to book them with my assistant to make sure that they can make the law pay link work. But every single call, I'm doing the same thing at the end. There's two step process to hire us. The first step is you sign the contract. The second step is you pay 50% down of whatever flat fee I'm quoting you. We send you the link to pay and the link to sign. You can do both on your phone. If you've got your credit card handy, I'll cut 50% of that out and I'll take your credit card right now or the phone. Mm -hmm. And they give me their credit card number before I get them off the first 30 minutes. 100%. And and I was going to echo that. Like we had the question about ghosting that like is above a little bit. Like one thing may be to walk through the retainer with them on the phone and be ready to take the credit card and say, okay, so if you'd like to move forward, great. So would you like to use a visa or like, <laughs> hang on, what are we doing? I mean, but that's, a, that, that's an imposter syndrome thing too. Like you, I don't know, but it might, might be part of it is like, oh my God, like, do I have the you know, the gall to do that. Yes, you do. Can I follow up? Do I want the answer? But then also, is there anyone who is going to make this decision with you? Now in criminal defense, maybe that's not the case, but maybe you actually do need to go talk to the family, for example, who's going to pay your bills. Or do you think that it's right for me, mom, to, you know, sign on to this financing plan with Justy's law firm? I mean, there's a lot of people who want to have discussions and they're not always going to tell you that they need to have that discussion, but they're more likely to do so if you ask them directly. Ask them. Is yes, there just anyone ask them. You who <laughs> need to make this decision with you, you know, or do you need yeah. to talk to anyone before making this decision if they don't give you that credit card right then, if they don't sort of yeah. 
make a strong indication they're going to sign. And I ask people too, is this affordable to you? Oh yeah. If not, talk to me about why and what I can do to make it more affordable because we work with people, right? Like we care about people and that signals that from the very beginning too. So I, that's what I ask. If this is not affordable to you, okay, is there somebody who in your family is going to help you make these payment arrangements? Would you like me to talk to them? I can make myself available for a 10 minute follow-up phone call. Oh, they're right here. Okay. Put me on speaker, right? Like, you know, half the time it's that simple or they call me together mm-hmm. and then I'm just like, mm, okay. This I think goes all the way back to the very beginning of your conversation where I, at least I tell people, I'm going to ask you questions. So from the very beginning, from the first 30 seconds, they are primed and ready for me to interrupt them and ask them questions. I haven't told them what I'm going to be asking them questions about, but I've told them I'm going to be asking them questions so that I can get all the information that I need. So I would, I would challenge you folks, don't be afraid to ask questions. Just tell them up front, you're going to be asking questions. Like, I'll, like so many times I'll get on the phone and they'll be like, so what are we going to talk about? How does this all work? And I'm like, well, I'm so glad you asked because here's what's going to happen. I'm going to ask you what your big goal is. And then you're going to tell me, but be aware, I'm going to interrupt you. And I don't mean to be rude, but I just need to make sure that I get all the information from you that I need so that I can help you. Because I have so much experience, right? Like that in your client's mind is what they're reading. When you say that it says, I have the experience. I know what to ask. It builds trust and it validates why they contacted you and that they're in the right place right yeah Um, just you i think you have to set the tone from the beginning and then that gives you leeway to you know to start really digging into their lives and asking questions i also wanted to add one thing um for i think it was was it melanie that was asking about the ghosting well and i know i mean this happens to a lot of people so Alternative perspective, one thing that may help you to in the spirit of research and data collection Mm -hmm. is, you know, maybe like a two for one would be like, you could spend, you know, early January, I know it's the holidays now, you could spend early January being like, you know, we're just doing a courtesy outreach, hope you had a wonderful holiday season, we just want to see how your experience has been like, every time you buy something with a company, don't you get the how did we do survey, like at the end of the receipt or in an email or whatever, I mean, you can be no different, right, and this is a good information collecting, so A, you get the whole like, wow, they just reached out to me, they don't want anything from me, everything's fine, like they're just seeing, but you could actually do like a survey and say, Hey, so we were just curious, like what made you choose us? And like, how did you find us? And do some information collecting, choose 10 clients that you're like the 10, if I could just have 200 of these types, right? Exactly. You know, the, the favorite kinds you have, whether it's the type of matter that they're doing or their personality, figure out the common denominators. I mean, like, you know, we can talk about this stuff on a webinar, but there's some legwork involved here, right? If you're hitting these hurdles, there's going to be some legwork. And, you know, it is kind of fascinating to step back and say, okay, the last three months of 2020, okay, who are my favorite clients? What did I, who did I like the most? Who are the easiest? Like, oh, they just paid. It was easy, but it's not just ability to pay. We know that there's personality types. There's certain types of matters, whatever. Look at the common denominators. What do you want to rinse and repeat in clients? What would you dream of having 200 more of this type of client or matter or whatever, figure out the common denominators, look at what the patterns were and reach out to those 10 or 15 people and just ask and just say it's a courtesy. And, you know, just wanted to do a call and see, you know, how we can further serve you. But also like, how did you find us? Just want to understand like, what made you choose us? And what do you like about what we're, you know, what do you like about us as a law firm? What makes you happy with your decision? Do some research. Seriously. I mean, it's, Absolutely. It's, and and if, so that's an alternative to just the, the mystery of why people ghost. And, you know, if you, if you figure out what's working, guess what? You could just do more of that and it's rinse and repeat. So, so yeah, I mean, <laughs> if there like is one thing that comes out of that also, I mean, that's really like a two for one, three for one sort of conversation. Like you find out that you know, there may have been actually a discrepancy or a gap and that person's going to share information with you that's both positive and negative and you get to learn, you know, a little bit more than you expected to. The other benefit is that you can ask them for a review if they haven't already written one because they've just written it for you by speaking to you on the phone. I love that. Fresh in their mind, ask them to post it and then you get something that is outward and also for internal processes. I also want to add one last thing here that in the event that like, 
and I'm sure this is some percentage of the ghosting because it always is, right? Like the, the price that they heard what just like didn't match up to what they had in their head. Right. Um, that's a thing, right? It's just like they, everybody comes in with, with, an, with a number or a range and, you know, like we talk about context and, you know, how, why we have scripting and framework to provide context for it and somewhat of a justification, right? But sometimes it's, it's not good enough for them. Like they, they don't, it, they, it's not a matchup in their mind. Um, this is just my two cents on the matter. I, I, you know, people can feel free to disagree with me. I would, if that's an issue for you, if you feel like money is a consistent issue with clients not being willing to move forward with you or like asking for discounts or anything around money, I would stay away from the following words and phrases in your marketing and on your website. Reasonable, low cost, affordable. Totally. Like I cannot 100%. understand why people use these terms. And I get it. Like Justy, for example, like your practice area is one where you're serving people like in a certain, you know, so I respect that. And there are reasons, right? Like for using those to terms. maybe lead with that, or that's part of what you do. He but like do majority of us, like I'm sorry, I'm a business attorney. So if you don't have a biz, like, you know what I mean? That's my take on it. But I, I cannot understand why we use phrases that cut, like that work against us. And then you're, I see, you know, I'm on, I'm on boss lady ESQ, which mm -hmm. is like a huge 8,000 attorney. I'm one of the admins. Um, mm -hmm. I manage my own group of trademark attorneys, which is like 1700 attorney. I mean, I'm in part of all these groups and we're consistently complaining about boundaries and how we get emails at 10 at night. Well, do you have the word accessible on your website? I mean, like stuff it's like that is like so reasonable, it. low cost. So marketing, marketing matters and believe it or not, again, back to the imposter syndrome. I swear I'm done saying that for today, but you do have control over who and what calls you and what contacts you. You're a magnet. You are drawing it in. So take it, you know, uh, a step back and look at your marketing too. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I will say that actually it's extremely important in how you set expectations on the call. You're setting expectations what Sonia is getting at far before you get on the call. So when it's your screening form, if you don't see the answers that you're looking for, then pivot refer, et cetera, as we talked about. Also make sure that you're asking the right questions. One of the other things that you can ask, and sorry, we're gonna go a minute over because we just have so much to say here. But one of the other things you can ask is how ready do you feel to hire an attorney? Because that also can take the temperature. Yes, we're talking about exit interviews and how did you feel about the experience? And you know, were there any things that I could have done better? Or would you refer us to a friend, et cetera? But, if you take the temperature up front, all the other answers may look like a gold star waiting for you. But if they say they're a three out of 10 in terms of readiness to hire an attorney, then you have to take that with a grain of salt. And you go into that conversation expecting or even directly asking, hey, so why did you mark yourself a three out of 10? And you could say, you know, you could hear something like, oh, my very close relative is telling me this is not a good idea or such and such, right? So get to the root of that number and then you'll also have a more productive conversation. Um, now we are <laughs> way out of time, unfortunately. Um, you know, I just want to take, and if you have to go, go. Um, and that goes for any of our panelists too. I you. feel like we should do this monthly. There's yeah. with the four of us. Because this is like, I mean, we could have spent a day talking about this. Maybe we should. But um, there will be a follow-up to this for sure. One of the things that I see most often, this is my, the, my parting question for you. And yes, we're going to go a minute over. Um, there are a lot of people who are really uncomfortable with remote selling in work environments. They are very used to, and I know everyone here, you've been selling remote and you have been on the phone, video calls, you're very comfortable with it. But I'm sure there was a time when you can relate to people who are new at this for the first time and they're thinking, I really got so much energy. I thrived in that office environment sitting across from someone and making that sale you know there's an aspect of just doing it and getting into a new habit but is there anything that quickly you would recommend uh, for people who are sort of feeling discomfort there or, or lack of confidence or imposter syndrome as Sonia rightly pointed out yes so I, I have always been a remote firm I have always dealt with my clients virtually in part because some of my clients are outside of the United States. So building rapport, 
on the phone or via Zoom is not something new. And it's not new for any of us. Long before video calls, long before FaceTime, we spent time cultivating relationships with our friends on the phone, right? Mm -hmm. If you were a 70s child, you spent a significant amount of your time on the phone. So you can and have developed relationships on the phone. You have called customer service and conned your way into having a late fee overturned conjure way into getting a 10% discount on something, right? We've all done it. So just because it's now coming in the context of work, don't let it freak you out. You are, you are having a conversation. You are figuring out if you can help someone. Yes, you can still talk with your hands. That will come through online. That will come through with your voice, but we've all cultivated relationships not being in person. Now, we may be a little rusty at it, right? Because I'm, I'm quick to text, but we still know how to cultivate relationships. So I think we've all got to get out of our own head about it Boy. and just remember that we all know how to pick up a phone. We all know how to put our phone to our ear, have a conversation and get what we need. We've been cultivating relationships since we were children, right? It's, it's not difficult. So part of it is you, you just have to do it, but recognize that you're already doing it. So all of these calls that we've had via Zoom with people that we haven't seen from high school in 20 years, you know, or, or law school, all of a sudden we're like, oh my God, Zoom is so great. It's no different than with a client. Like our potential clients are doing the exact same thing. So if you liked to run your mouth on the phone or you like to text a whole lot, you can in fact be very successful closing clients on the phone or via Zoom or via Skype. And, and if y'all need to practice, call me. I'm more than happy to chit chat on Zoom with you. I'm more than happy to like help you feel comfortable with all of like the controls or whatever, but nobody, like our potential clients expect there to be technical hiccups. If you have a potential client who has a school-aged child at home, they are going to understand that you started talking with the mute on. They're going to understand that like your Wi-Fi connection is unstable. Every, like like the, this, it's just leveled the playing field for a lot of us. So you just have to remember your potential clients are people. Like we're all people. We're all just trying to get through this. And My having team. process is going to help you be more confident if you know your approach to these conversations and you're not just winging it because that is the single best way to make yourself uncomfortable on a call. I was going to suggest also, um, so I'm a, some of, a lot of this stuff I've shared, you can hear like emulates what big brands and big companies do. Cause I'm like, well, if it works for them and it does, it works for them. And it also like, it works for these global brands, what they, their practices, their, their routines. And so a fraction of that, like a little sprinkling in your law practice is really all you need. And so the concept of focus groups, right? Like, you know, why, why not grab a neighbor or a friend or somebody, or, you know, you can pay people for their time, you know, like how companies do and say, can I do a practice consult with you? Take an average person or think about who, you know, right. From like high school, college, law school, I mean, law school classmates are great. Other lawyers. And I mean, again, we're all part of these groups on Facebook and just say, how hey, I'm willing to compensate three to five attorneys for their time right? This is a well worth it marketing expense. Think of it that way. And where the end of the year, you need to pro probably find stuff to spend, you know, as deductible expenses, right? I know I'm like trying to figure that out, but pay people for their time and say, can I just do a, a like a role play consult with you? And, you know, as somebody who would be interested in this, this service, who's my target market. And uh, I mean, another lawyer would be awesome, probably, or, you know, take a non-lawyer, take your people in your network, friends, colleagues from the past, companies, whatever, and just practice on them, right? And they will tell you, especially if they're paying or you're paying them, sorry, they'll be honest with me. Don't critique me, tell me the good, the bad, the ugly. And so 
again, we can talk about this in theory all the time, but the, you have to be a student of your own business. That's what I've learned, you guys, is I'm a student of, I'm constantly studying what works, what doesn't, re reorganize it, re-engineer it, you know, and you have to do those things. If you're not willing to put in these pieces of work, then you're going to have to stay a lawyer, but you can't be a business owner. Like the part about being a business owner is this part. This is That's it. Absolutely. Like you have to, you just have to. And, and for your peace of mind, you know, moving forward that you know exactly what your foundation is built upon, right? Like how can you guarantee yourself, you know, you're relying on yourself for your income, steady income in the future if you don't have these repeatable processes. So Sonia, you know, just to piggyback on what you're saying, if you get that focus group, if you do those mock consults, especially with other attorneys who know exactly what you're looking for, give them a role to play. Be the really difficult asking every, every question under the sun. Be the skeptical person. Be the person who's sort of quiet and mousy and doesn't ask all the right questions and you have to try and read their mind, right? Um, ask if you can follow up with them and if there's anything in your follow-up process even. Like it doesn't have to stop at just that consult. You can have some follow-ups and maybe you see, oh, there's an overlap or you sent me two emails in one day or why are you sending this to me? It's about your different practice area that doesn't relate to what I came in about. That's also something that's important to audit. Um, so let's get you know, one last comment and then how to reach you and we'll wrap up because I know we're already over. So thanks for everyone who's still sticking around. Um, I was just also going to reiterate as far as doing Zoom and, and phone, quite frankly, my clients don't want to come to me anyway. They never did. They never want to take time out of their day to come to a lawyer's office ever. Like yeah, never. And our, our family law clients are the same way now. Everybody is so busy all the time. It's really easy to pick up the phone for 30 minutes. Do you know how hard it would be to operate in a third of the state of Colorado if I made you drive to my office for the initial consult? I cut my target market in about a 10th versus what it would be online. So it opens up doors for people who, would, who don't have transportation, right? Like I do a lot of DUI work. You lose your license, you can't come see me. How the heck are you supposed to find a lawyer if you can't get to their office, right? Um, we really play up technology too. And we're pretty big. We market ourselves as the anti-old white dude law firm. Um, so we're pretty big into blowing up the system. And technology is a way to do that. And we tell clients, frankly, the fact that I don't have an office for you to come to means I can charge you less. My overhead is minimal. And that is a selling point for people. Like they know that the money they pin to spend on me isn't going to my landlord. It isn't going to insurance. It's going to get quality legal work. And I can't afford to do things like cut discounts when I need to, right? But also raise my rates at <laughs> different times. It solves a lot of problems. <laughs> yeah, it solves a lot of problems in different ways. Um, and we have a nice little mix. So with that, thank you, Maddie, for having me. I appreciate it as always. I love seeing you, ladies. Sonia, it was nice to meet you. Carol. Nice to meet you too, both of you.